this evening. Well, basically, it's a sense, there's a sense of deja vu, really, because Dr. Philip Brown from Maidon is sitting over here. And when I asked him to come, just to be here, he told me that one of the first times when he had, uh, coming to FCCT was in 1981. And, the, and there was a panel discussion. It was, it was chaired by Dennis Gray, who was probably on the board of president at that time, and is still around, is the dean of the press corps, actually, for foreign press corps. And the theme of that discussion was apparently, is Thailand losing its wildlife? So I mean, here we are back in 2015, essentially asking the same question, but uh, looking at the region as a whole, the, the, the greater Mekong sub-region, as it's called, as a whole. Um, <clears throat> it is certainly too late for some other countries in the region. And um, remarkably, this region is one of the world's top five for biodiversity. As many as 367 new species were catalogued, discovered and catalogued by scientists between, just between 2012 and 2013. Yet, the same region has, not, has lost nearly one third of its forests in the last 35 to 40 years and could be left with just 10 to 20% by 2030. And as we know, uh, the region is getting much more developed under ASEAN integration plans, highways, railways, more dams, of course, on the Mekong system. Um, and in a couple of hours' time, I know that the, forest, the NGO Forest Trends will be bringing out a report with some really alarming statistics on Cambodia's forest loss. So it, things are not at all uh, in a happy state in this area. And as it happens, today is also Global Tiger Day, which I actually didn't, didn't know when I was organizing this panel. I'm not really sure who decides these things, and I was telling Tom Gray it, it might well be WWF. <laughs> but uh, it's fortuitous anyway. And on the tiger, the, um, it is interesting because in January, India announced that its tiger population was 2,226. Out of a total of wild tigers of about, just I, nobody really knows, but about just about 3,000 is probably a fairly rough estimate. Now, tiger numbers are small but recover, recovering relatively well in Russia, Nepal, Bhutan, India as well, of course. But um, the pressures are phenomenal. I mean, in this region, the value, the total value UNODC has, has estimated of environmental crime that is both timber and wildlife is estimated at, US, at, at 23 billion US dollars, which is roughly the combined GDP of Laos and Cambodia. So they're really up against it. And we have today a top-notch panel, which uh, is going to answer all the questions. Some of the, some of the panelists have come straight out of a meeting with the DNP today, the Department of National Parks, where they were discussing how many tigers Thailand has. So that is one of the questions which could be asked. Dr. Anak Patnavibun is <clears throat> has a remarkable career. Has started out as a, as a park ranger, did a master's in wildlife science at Oregon State University, and a PhD in environmental geography at the University of Victoria in BC, Canada. He has worked extensively in Thailand's Western Forest Complex, which is really the last or maybe the only and the best hope for tigers in this country. So he'll be telling us a little bit about that. And considering it's Global Tiger Day, it's probably appropriate to start with this flagship species because regrettably, it has virtually died out of Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. So you could say the, the tiger's range is from Siberia to Sumatra, and you could have said until recently it was from Western India to Vietnam. You cannot say that any longer, unfortunately, except for perhaps one or two stray animals left. So functionally extinct already in half the Mekong sub-region. Then we have Dr. Thomas Gray, Regional Species Manager based in Phnom Penh for the WWF Greater Mekong Region. He came first to the region in 2005 to study the Bengal florican, a remarkable bird. I think a lot of you over here would know that its courtship display is, is one of the phenomenons of nature. And Brian Gonzalez we have from the Freeland Foundation, as well as uh, Mark, Dr. Vatna Rak, better known as Mark Su, former Interpol, who is going to tell us about the enforcement side of things. So I will start, we should start with Dr. Anak. And um, yeah, we we'll start with the tiger. Come, come, come. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you were out there. I was looking past, looking over you. Dr. Anak, welcome to the FCCT. Please go ahead. <laughs> I think.
Go ahead over there, please. Hello, everyone. Um, first, I would like to thank Nermo for a very nice uh, introduction. This is my second time here in, uh, in this place, and uh, uh, this is the first time that I try food here. And I found that you know pork curry here is quite spicy, you know. It's, it's, it's for the foreign, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, international people. Uh, so I just uh, I have about ten minutes, so I want to go fast because I have too many slides. So I, I try to go fast in some slides. Uh, uh, I, I just want to uh, f uh, focus on uh, Thailand and, and 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 wildlife status and conservation. Yeah, and this is a picture of uh, a female tiger in Hue Kai Kang Wildlife Sanctuary. And uh, we got this t picture in uh, a little bit before 2010. And the government used this photo to try to promote tiger conservation in Thailand very much. It's in the cover page of their uh, Thailand Tiger Action Plan. And uh, today, uh, uh, many people uh, here also uh, just uh, attend the uh, Global Tiger Day meeting uh, organized by the government with the uh, financial support from WWF and Big Grim. And uh, uh, different organization here today, uh, you know, uh, this, this D2 is the uh, uh, high level government officer. So uh, we, we spent two days discuss about the uh, situation of tigers and the progress of conservation of tigers in Thailand. And uh, as no mom said, uh, give you uh, uh, um, uh, the introduction. I, 30 years ago, I, 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 I was a park ranger uh, uh, in uh, different two, two, two different wildlife sanctuaries in Thailand, you know, one in the south and one in the north. So I spent uh, 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 some time, uh, you know, uh, arresting people before in the past. And uh, uh, so this is a satellite map of uh, uh, Thailand and uh, uh, you can see some area of uh, forest uh, cover in uh, some neighboring country, like in Laos here, in Myanmar here, and in Cambodia here. And uh, uh, I just want to focus on Thailand. For, for, for Thailand, uh, uh, this is the protected areas, the map of the protected areas. The dark, dark brown is wildlife sanctuary, and light brown is national parks. And uh, as you can see, the situation at the moment for Thailand, uh, you have uh, forests remaining almost exactly the same shape of national park and, and wildlife sanctuaries. Nothing left outside. That's the situation in Thailand at the moment, compared to, you know, you see a lot of forests in Laos, a lot of forests in Cambodia. So that, that's, that, that, that's the situation in Thailand at the moment. And uh, the uh, protection system, uh, in Thailand now we have this number, quite many national parks and wildlife sanctuaries and also the smaller system of non-hunting area and forest park and uh, this, uh, these are the two main laws that protecting uh, uh, forests and wildlife in Thailand. And this is the uh, standard slide, you know, I just now I just want to focus on tigers. This is a standard slide to show people that uh, uh, globally Tiger is under uh, severe threat and uh, uh, almost uh, like 100 years ago, they said the population dropped from under 1,000 now to about less than 5,000 globally. So this is the uh, things that uh, some people uh, uh, don't know. And uh, as Nomo has mentioned, at the moment, the latest data now in this region, you know, in Cam from Cambodia, Laos, uh, Vietnam, uh, e and even in Myanmar, uh, 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 from the latest data, the people, scientists think at the moment uh, these four countries doesn't have uh, uh, functioning populations. They might have some left. Uh, some people believe that uh, they, they, they have gone from, from some country, some of these country. But some people think uh, even there are some left, but it's not functioning. The population is too small. And uh, th uh, th uh, this is the... Uh, uh, the situation of tigers in Thailand following the, uh, the tiger action plan and uh, uh, as you can see that uh, the red color is the area that we have base population of tigers that I will be focusing my talk about 
and uh, this is the forest complex, the western forest complex. And the red one is the best area for tigers in Thailand, and the dark brown, uh, the, uh, the brown colors are the, 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 the next uh, best one. So uh, you see that this is the uh, western forest, and the Kangkajan, and then uh, Khao Yai Taplan, and, uh, uh, and I just want to focus my talk only on, on these uh, four patches of, of forest. And the rest in Thailand, the yellow color is uh, no, no tiger record anymore. And the uh, uh, pink color is used to be tiger records, you know, just uh, 10 years ago, very few might be remaining, uh, no hope, you know, for those areas. You see that in southern Thailand, no hope for tigers anymore, you know, so it's all gone, you know. And uh, uh, so uh, this is the numbers of uh, tigers that the, the government estimated uh, uh, in the tiger action plan. Uh, you can see that the western forest, uh, this, this, this one, ha has the uh, biggest number of tigers uh, estimated uh, uh, recently. So, and I will show you how they estimated uh, tiger numbers. And uh, the rest is like, you know, the, the, the next best one is this one. This one is uh, here, uh, Khao Yai and uh, Dong Priya Yen is about this number, not, not many, you know. Uh, almost um, uh, about, you know, to be gone, I think, if we don't take care of this number well. And, uh, you know, Gangachan is even worse than, you know, this one, even worse than a lot of people think, you know. Uh, so that's, uh, and the rest is, you know, uh, very few. And first, uh, I want to uh, focus on this uh, Khao Yai and, 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 and Tap, Tap Lan, Phang Sida. This is a World Heritage Site. The whole thing here is a World Heritage Site. It's about uh, 6,200 square kilometers. And uh, Khao Yai in, uh, 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 is the best national park in Thailand. It's the most touristed park in Thailand. And uh, in 2003, uh, people put camera traps and got only uh, individual one tiger from those uh, camera traps they put in this park. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Freeland and Smithsonian uh, tried to put uh, more camera traps in the, uh, these years uh, following uh, that year, and they did not get a picture of tiger at all. So that's the situation of uh, the World Heritage Site at the moment. And, uh, but uh, there are some tiger re uh, re remaining in, in this area as the number is uh, right around 20, 20 tigers, people estimated. And uh, now I just want to go down to Gangajan. Gangajan is the biggest national park in Thailand and 2,900 square kilometers here. But uh, this is the uh, uh, distribution maps of elephants. So you see that elephant use only the southern part of this park. And uh, from the survey, uh, we fly transect all over the park. We found that the reason the northern part of the park uh, has no elephants because a lot of human traits here. So, uh, uh, and the situation in Gangajan for tiger, in 2003, we started to get this picture of this tiger and one leg cut off from snare. So this tiger has no future. So that, that in 2003. And then in 2000, uh, and, uh, 11 and, 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 and 12, uh, we tried to put camera trap on the base area of this park and we found, we got uh, three photographs of tiger and sadly, they come from one tiger, one individual tiger only. So that's the situation there. And now I just want to focus on this, this forest, uh, western forest, the biggest forest in Thailand. The whole thing is 18,000 square kilometers. And you can see that the, also in Myanmar, there's good track of forest still in Myanmar too. And uh, the World Heritage Site is in the middle. So this forest is still 80% forested. And it's also, uh, as I mentioned, World Heritage Site in 1991. So I want to skip this uh, quickly. And uh, the problem of this forest from the uh, evaluation uh, that they try to improve uh, the management, I just want to point out only some uh, issue. So, uh, for, uh, for, for the management not based on science is the, uh, the, the, uh, the most serious thing. But also, the, for the management, they found that park ranger still has weak uh, technical skill, and in some area, park ranger become poachers. So in Thailand, if you, have, you, if you 
do not take care of park rangers well, many of them become poachers. So that's ha happening in this forest before, like this picture, you know, poaching of banteng, uh, you know, poaching of langurs. I go quick on this, you know, some people still eating. So uh, bear, you know, they kill bear, and they still kill a uh, gal for trophy here. You know, samba for trophy, you know, some elephants, and even the poison tigers here. So that's, that's what happened here. And it, it some, uh, sometimes it's even worse because they, they, they try to kill elephant and smear the insecticides, you know, furadan uh, on this uh, carcass to attract tigers. And they got some tigers. So they kill an elephant to get tigers. So unbelievable for these poachers here. And then in, in 2005, you know, uh, the team uh, from WCS India Ulas and you know the team came to Thailand and tried to uh, uh, you know get us to think about recovery of tigers you know and by showing the graph here that the relationship between uh, the ungulates or prey density and tiger density in different national parks in India to make us think that uh, if you can increase the ungulates then you can increase tigers so that's uh, and then we have the plan you know uh, after. Uh, after that, we came up with a plan to try to increase tiger to uh, by 50%. The plan started in 2005, and we want to see a 50% increase in 2016. And we have to deal with you know poaching mainly, and also in effect in effective law enforcement. And we try to improve uh, uh, patrol system here, with all the monitoring system we have to build in. And this is the first photograph of tigers and cubs. These two cubs we got from the camera trap in 2005. Uh, you know, these two survive and produce cups already. And the, the, the patrol system, I, I don't have time to explain into detail, but we try to uh, put signs into patrol system. And then now, then you know that uh, the patrol, where they, where they cover, uh, what frequency they cover. So now from this uh, World Heritage site, Hue Kai Kang, Tung Yai, now we have the system cover more area. WWF has uh, you know, helped the government on these two national parks and uh, uh, Zoological Society of London help on this park. And the camera trap system also, we have the camera trap poise in uh, every year. We, the, we have been doing camera trap to estimate tiger population. And this is the numbers of individual tigers received from camera trap in Hue Kai Kang alone. Uh, this year we got, uh, the, no, no, the, this is a number of, from camera traps, and this is the estimated number from the uh, 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 statistical analysis. So, and you see that uh, now the number is, uh, in this park, in the, uh, in the uh, western forest is uh, getting uh, better. Now I think uh, it's, uh, you can say that uh, it's almost reached the goal of 50% increase within, uh, since uh, 2007. Actually, we started since 2005. And, but you can see that the patrol effort is also increased. You know, this is the patrol effort in the uh, kilometers, distance of kilometers. And now uh, from the tigers, uh, uh, the concentration of tigers from another kind of surveys, we also receive uh, the information that tigers in this area, the darker the uh, grid cell mean, the better uh, uh, occupancy of tigers. So you have, as you see, that this uh, tiger distribution mainly in the core area and dispersed into the north. And elephants, you can see uh, the elephant, the situation is better than tigers here. And for Banteng, this is endangered species, globally endangered species, and still found only in this park, Gao Samba. And now, after 10 years of very uh, intensive protection, like uh, I have shown on the map, uh, you can see this uh, Banteng easily. You know, some people have witnessed this uh, already. The first year we started in 2005, uh, at the same spot here, we found nine Bantengs shot within one year. So now it's, it's getting quite, you know, quickly recovered. And also tiger dispersed into, from, from the core area to, to these two national parks. You know, uh, you know these cubs born here and now settled here. So, and uh, you, you, you uh, uh, just, uh, I just want to show this. Uh, oops, oh, maybe, I don't know, the video doesn't work. Uh, no. 
Don't, don't, don't worry. It's about the, the, that, that, that tiger with uh, mother and two cubs, you know. And now another, an, another evidence is the tigers born here and move here 100 kilometers to settle here. So uh, it's getting better in, in, in the situation in this western forest. And also you know, sometimes you face with, you know, poachers that this uh, uh, Thai uh, guy and this is Vietnamese guy arrested. Uh, without uh, uh, only agar wood, uh, they they uh, they found. But in the cell phone, there's picture of him sitting on this tiger with AK-47, and we 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 were we were able to match this tiger with the camera trap tiger we have. This is big male, and this guy got uh, uh, five years uh, in jail, and uh, the Vietnamese guy got four years in jail. And this is the Vietnamese passport here. So this is uh, almost the final slide. So the, the, to save Tiger, we try to convince people here, government and NGOs, that you, know, you have to stop uh, denial of what's happening really in the field and apply up-to-date technology and you know, try to create inviolate places and use science to guide management. But many times, uh, from my experience, sometimes it's quite difficult because uh, you can be sacked easily if you are superintendents and reporting the truth too much you know, here in this country. And then uh, uh, sometimes people just use signs for, for a show only. So that's what I found. And, uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, use signs to guide manage management, but motivation is very needed here. Because, you know, people, like park rangers here got killed every year. And this one, I, I trained him, you know, and he was shot by a poacher uh, in 2013. So uh, we are very young, uh, you know. And this is all the sponsors for the work in the Western Forest. So thank you. So that. <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Anak. I'll ask you to um, stay there, actually. And uh, Tom Gray, would you come up? Yeah. Tom's bio is interesting. Apart from the studying the Bengal florican, it says it, you've used leeches to search for the saula. And you've also been sampling water in the Mekong for the giant catfish, so I think you're the right person. Okay. Thank you, Nirmal, and thank you, uh, everybody. So every year, WWF Greater Mekong compiles a list of the new species of birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and higher plants that have been described in the five countries of the Mekong in the previous 12 months. Our latest report was released in June and documented 139 new species. And this brings a total of new species described in this region since 1997 to a pretty staggering 2,216. These are two of the um, highlights from this year's report. A, um, a gecko from the limestone karst forest of northern Laos. There was actually the 10,000th species of reptile described globally. And a crocodile newt from Shan State in eastern Myanmar. And from the previous year's report, Cambodian tailor bird. Remarkably, a new species of bird described from Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia. So pretty much throughout the Mekong, Wherever scientists look, discoveries are made. When Vietnam and Laos opened up to scientists in the early 1990s, a suite of new mammals were discovered. This is a striped rabbit, Anamite striped rabbit, whose nearest relation occurs in the mountains of central Sumatra. And more remarkably, Sao La, an entirely new genus, an entirely new tribe of large mammal that was discovered in the mountains of Vietnam and Laos in the early 1990s. And this photograph, it may not be the greatest photograph you've ever seen, but the IUCN described it as the most significant camera trap image from Asia in the 21st century. It's the first wild photograph of Sao La from the 21st century. And evidence that this, which has been called the Asian unicorn because of its its beautiful straight horns, is persisting in the wild, in the remote forests of Vietnam and Laos. However, obviously, Sao La and the rest of the biodiversity in this region are under massive, massive threats. 
I think many of you will be aware of what this image represents. There are more humans inside the circle than outside it. And with more than half of the world's humanity in a place of such high biodiversity, there are obviously going to be threats and challenges. And to many of us, the Mekong River represents the largest population of freshwater dolphins left in Southeast Asia. It represents these Mekong megafauna, some of the largest freshwater fish on the planet, the critically endangered Mekong giant catfish, which is as bigger than your average car. However, of course, to others, the Mekong is a potential source of energy. Until the beginning of this year, the lower Mekong was free-flowing. However, there are 13 mainstream dams planned on the Mekong in uh, Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia. 13 dams that were largely designed in the 1950s and are using 1950s technology. And this is the first of these. Zayabori Dam in central Laos, central northern Laos. And we believe that earlier this year, Zayabori Dam passed the point of ecological no return. It passed the point at which millions of years of fish migration are going to be permanently disrupted. And with obvious implications for human livelihoods, for food security, and also, of course, for species conservation. And beyond the demand for energy, there's a demand for wildlife products. This is from when I visited Mong La on the Myanmar-China border earlier this year. And this massive demand for wildlife products is creating a very Southeast Asian phenomenon of empty forests. This is the last Javan rhino from mainland Southeast Asia, which was poached for its horn in Kachien in southern Vietnam in 2010. And this is the last image of wild tiger from Cambodia, photographed in November 2007 from Mondulkiri in eastern Cambodia. So, is biodiversity in this region doomed? So, hope, happily, uh, I hope and, um, and believe it isn't. And I hope and believe that we have solutions and <coughs> One of the solutions is unquestionably law enforcement and protected area management, as so well done by, by Freeland and others. And a great example is Nepal, where this photograph comes from. And Nepal is a country who certainly in terms of GDP is as poor as any in this region. Yet Nepal has been able to achieve zero poaching of rhino in the face of massive threats as a result of high-level political buy-in. And we heard from Dr. Anak, success in Waikakeng with recovery of the beautiful Bantang. So there, t there are tools available to follow the success of Nepal, to try and achieve zero poaching as Nepal have has done. However, unfortunately, many of these tools aren't really applied. This is an assessment by um, a consortium of NGOs and governments of how the 13 Tiger Range countries are faring in applying some of these tools for, to achieve zero poaching in their protected areas. And you can see that the three countries on the far right are Vietnam, Laos, Myanmar, and Cambodia. Four countries even. Four countries in this region. And it's no coincidence that the two countries on the far left of the graph, India and Russia, have greater than 85% of the world's tigers remaining are in those two countries. There's a clear correlation between effective law enforcement and where tigers remain. However, India and Nepal have one quite major difference from this region. Most people are vegetarian. And that the domestic pressures on wildlife in those countries are much, much less than we get in Southeast Asia. So in addition to protected area management and law enforcement, another component of the future needs to be behavior change and demand reduction. And many of you will have probably seen this Cho Chang campaign of WWF Thailand, trying to get people to imagine a world without, without elephants, and the obvious links to the ivory trade and ivory that's for sale here in Bangkok. 
a little more subtly in Vietnam, which is a massive uh, market for rhino horn, largely as a high-end status symbol. Uh, Traffic and other partners have been designing tailored messaging to address the emotional and functional drivers of rhino horn use in Vietnam. And such approaches need to be widely applied throughout this region to reduce the demand and reduce the pressures that are impacting our, um, our wildlife. And finally, there is perhaps sort of single, ambitious, and transformative ideas. Ideas to perhaps try and get the high-level political buy-in needed to secure some of these wildernesses and secure some of our um, fantastic species. And one such idea, which WWF and others are supporting, is the idea of the Cambodian government to potentially bring tigers back to Cambodia, to reintroduce tigers to the eastern plains of Cambodia, which would be the first transboundary reintroduction of an Asian big cat. And we and a few others believe this could be one of the only ways to get that high-level political momentum and high-level political buy-in to secure some of these um, remaining fantastic sites. So that's, that's me, Dante. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Tom. Nice and comprehensive as well as precise. Now we'll call upon Mark. Um, Brian, you'll be taking questions later, right? So you'll join later? Okay. we call upon Mark. We're switching gears now to the protection and enforcement aspect of all this. So, right, Mark is going to tell us something about that, about ASEAN when and how the region uh, collaborates on enforcement. Okay, good evening everyone. So my presentation, <coughs> um, I have um, two parts. So the first one is going to be the video presentation and the another one is going to be the PowerPoint. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and start with the uh, video first. It's beautiful. Southeast Asia is home to some of the rarest and most exquisite species on the planet, attracting conservationists, nature lovers, and visitors from around the globe. Sadly, not everyone's content to simply see the sights. Some want to poach, steal, or slaughter them. Southeast Asia is now a global hotspot for the illegal wildlife trade, worth billions of US dollars every year. If the illegal trade in rare and endangered species continues at the current rate, experts warn that at least 40% of Southeast Asia's animal and plant species could be wiped out this century. What's more, we are increasingly seeing wildlife trafficking has serious implications for the security and prosperity of people around the world. Local populations that depend on wildlife, either for tourism or sustenance, are finding it harder and harder to maintain their livelihoods. Diseases are spreading to new corners of the globe through wildlife that is not properly inspected at border crossings. Park rangers are being killed. And we have good reason to believe that rebel militias are players in a worldwide ivory market worth millions and millions of dollars a year. To combat the illegal wildlife trade, the ASEAN Wildlife Enforcement Network was launched in 2005. ASEAN WEN is part of the Regional Action Plan on Trade in CITES, Wild, Fauna and Flora, devised by all 10 ASEAN countries. It's now the largest intergovernmental wildlife enforcement network in the world. The network faces a daunting task. 
but cross-border cooperation between customs, police and enforcement agencies of the 10 ASEAN member states has brought results. In the past four years, ASEAN WEN has rescued more than 150,000 live animals. These tiny cubs are just a handful of wildlife trade victims freed by vigilant customs officers at Bangkok Airport a year ago. And this massive haul of ivory tusks, amounting to 120 dead elephants, was intercepted on a flight from East Africa to Laos in a consignment marked as telecommunications equipment. The tusks are just a tiny fragment of the massive 40 metric tons of ivory seized by enforcement officials in ASEAN since 2009. And their achievements haven't gone unnoticed. Some of the most successful initiatives we've seen so far are the regional wildlife enforcement networks. These networks are critical to strengthening protection efforts and enhancing cooperation among key countries. Despite the success stories, for every consignment intercepted, it's generally accepted that hundreds more illicit cargoes slip across ASEAN borders every day. Strong, effective cooperation, resources, and commitment by governments and their staff are needed if ASEAN WEN is to win the war against ruthless and well-organized wildlife traffickers. ASEAN WEN is supported by the United States Agency for International Development's arrest program implemented by Freeland Foundation. Other partner organizations include the CITES Secretariat, Interpol, the World Customs Organization, Traffic Southeast Asia, and TRACE. ASEAN WEN is the commitment of the 10 ASEAN member states to develop a strong network of task forces and interagency cooperation among law enforcement agencies across the region. Training, raising awareness, collaborating on investigations and sharing information about wildlife crime. Enforcement agencies in Southeast Asia and around the world are now working together to fight illegal wildlife trafficking and protect the region's biodiversity. Working with CITES, so a century from now, our great-grandchildren can witness the wonders of our wildlife and still say, yes, it's beautiful. ASEAN is committed to realizing the ASEAN community by 2015. Issues confronting the conservation and sustainable management of wildlife resources and the CITES carry strong negative implications to the three pillars of the ASEAN community. Successful cooperation on CITES issues under ASEAN will not only promote generally the sustainable management and protection of the root biodiversity that the ASEAN region has, but specifically, but will effectively provide ASEAN countries effective mechanisms and safeguards in ensuring that the three pillars of the ASEAN community are promoted. Okay, so basic, basically now, um, which I just uh, see the video presentation about the ASEAN Wildlife Enforcement uh, Network. And then <coughs> I will uh, talk about the Operation Crowbar which is, um, is one of the very success operations that we have and we conduct. The Operation Cobar is, uh, we have one, two, and three. And listen, recently, we just finished uh, the third Operation Cobar. 
So before we go to the Operation Cobar, um, I will talk about uh, how it happened. So basically, at the ASEAN WEN meeting in 2008, at the uh, Special Investigation Group, um, at this time, we thinking we would like to create uh, a task force that is really uh, focusing on the specific animal. So at that time, we creating the uh, special investig investigation group, or we call the SIG, and we focusing on the pangolin and the big cat. And then on the October 2010s, so the SIG is expand to to not only include the ASEAN member state, we also have the South Asia Wildlife Enforcement Network and the Lusaka Agreement Tech Force to join with us. And since uh, the African country is participate, uh, we also focus on the elephant ivory and the rhino horn trade. On June 2010, um, so this week we went to the Nanning in China uh, because, as of we know, that the Chinese is one of the uh, biggest consumer country. So, at this time, the Chinese is uh, they agree to join the SIG with us and working uh, to fight against the wildlife crimes. On the October um, 2012, so basically in the meetings uh, of the ASEAN WEN, SAWEN, and then the LATIF, we was discussed we would like to create some of the operations that is a real time and face to face networking. And then in this meeting, we agree that we would like to create the Operation Koba One. So basically, the Operation uh, Koba One is on the January uh, 2013 in Bangkok. So basically, in this meeting, it's a one month long operation. And we have about 22 participating countries in the world. And for the Operation Kuba One uh, result, so this is the um, the seizure that uh, we made. I will go really quickly and focus on the uh, Operation Kuba Three. And on March 2013, at the the manager course in Bangkok. So basically. Uh, we uh, conduct. Uh, we are uh, conducting the operation Koba to. So basically, as you as you can see in the picture, so face to face networking it equally to task and result. The reason why for the law enforcement officials, if it not trust. So it's very difficult um, to work and sharing the information because if you don't trust, how how can you uh, believe if you share your information or your intelligence, it will go to the right people or the right organizations. So basically, you know, when the operation when you're working together, so they creating more tasks. The picture here is the um, Operation Kuba 2 based in Bangkok. And for the Operation Kuba 2, we have 28 participating uh, country. And for the Kuba 2, we have two war rooms. So one is in Bangkok, Thailand. As the picture you can see in the Ilia, Bangkok. And the another one uh, is in the Nairobi. Kenya. 
and this is the result of the operation COBA2 and it's not only the wildlife um, that we seizure it's a lot of the illegal logging like rosewood for example and for the rosewood uh, for th this specific case basically uh, they have the illegal achievement of rosewood logging in uh, Tanzania from Madagascar based on the intelligence provided by the iQuick partner um, to the ICT. The ICT stands for the uh, International Coordination Team. And then for the International Coordination Team, we pass forward to the Tanzania um, officer. So this is the COBA2 as well. And we also collecting the, uh, the DNA test analysis for the future reference as well. And the Operation COBA3 is on the March 4 to Ma uh, I mean May 4 to May 27, 2015. At the time, uh, we're thinking to war room uh, uh, it doesn't work well for us, so that's why we conduct only one war room here in Bangkok. So, of course, this time the iQuicks, um, they are uh, a sponsor for, for the uh, financials and then the, the technical support. So basically, for the Operation Cobra 3, we have 62 countries participating, um, including in the six regions, ASEAN, East Asia, South Asia, Europe, Africa, North America, and of course the uh, representative from the International Consortium on Combating Wildlife Crimes, or the IQUIC. And the picture you hear, uh, we uh, was announced the readiness of the Operation COBA-3 at the uh, Interpol uh, General Secretariat in Lyon, France. And as you can see, they have more country participating now, which is 62 country. And this is the first time that the uh, European uh, Union also participate with us. And then for the intergovernmental organizations, of course, before uh, the, uh, the CITES uh, Secretariat and the World Custom Organization uh, participate in the COBA 1 and COBA 2. But for the COBA 3, um, the Interpol and the Europol is also on board with us and also the Asinapol as well. If talking about the US government organizations, uh, we have the International Crimes Investigative Training Assist, Assist Program, or the ECTAP, and then the United States Fisher and Wildlife Service. So basically, on the 18th June 2015, at the Loyal Thai Police Headquarters, the law enforcement official from the 62 country, um, we have the press conference, um, same time and same day, um, globally. So um, the outcomes of the Operation Cobra 3, basically we have more than 300 uh, seizure of the uh, suspect, including the kingpin and over 600 uh, seizure of assaulted wildlife counterbands. And as you can see um, on this one, that the, uh, the seizure of the 4.3 tons, uh, one of the largest elephant ivory hawk in Thailand on transit from uh, Congo and then the destination uh, to Lao PDR. 
and in the following following weeks, we also seizure the three one ton of the ivory from Kenya shipped to the uh, uh, to here as well. And then uh, not so long after, at the Singapore also seizure the three point seven ton and so forth. So basically, um, it's a lot of outcome that you can see. Okay. So the array suspect, including the air kingpin, is one Chinese national involved in Namibia, biggest rhino horn uh, smoking case. Another is elephant poacher in India and the two Chinese national in relate to the seizure of 1.3 tons and 65 rhino horns and four Vietnamese national in the seizure of 12 rhino horn in Mozambique. So uh, the six uh, key suspects were arrested in Kenya in connection with the 3.1 ton and 3.7 ton of the elephant ivory seizure in Thailand and Singapore, uh, respectively. Why two kingpin involved in this case are fugitive? And in, the, in India, also three suspects arrest in connection to the position of the suspect tiger bones. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Brian, will you come up, please? Thanks a lot. We'll go to uh, questions in a minute. There's, there should be a mic over there. I don't know where it is, but it'll be there up shortly. So while you're thinking of your question, perhaps I'll, I'll start. And Brian, since you're the last to join, you get the first question from me. Could you tell me something? And maybe Mark also can contribute. Could you tell me something about enforcement and seizures is one thing. What about prosecutions and convictions? Could you brief us a little bit about the prosecution and conviction rate? on wildlife and timber offenses in the region. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Nirmal, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I work for Freeland, uh, before I answer your question. I work for Freeland, and I am, um, unlike these uh, three gentlemen here, uh, they're monitoring species and criminals. I am uh, monitoring the laws, legislations, and policies in ASEAN related to uh, wildlife crime and uh, associated laws that can be used to prosecute wildlife crime. So uh, to respond to Nirmal's uh, question on the, on the conviction rate and the prosecution, we have actually uh, uh, data from 2008 to, 2000 to present uh, the enforcement actions that happened in ASEAN. Enforcement action means seizures, arrests, and convictions. And uh, based on roughly, I don't have the exact data with me, uh, it's roughly 10%. Uh, 10 to 15 percent uh, conviction rate uh, in ASEAN. Uh, those who were caught and, uh, and uh, eventually tried in court and convicted in court, so around 10 to 15, and we have data for that. Actually, if you talk to uh, drug uh, enforcers, they would say that oh, the wildlife, you're, you guys are doing better than us because. 10 to 15 is high already. Okay. Okay, we have a question already. Yeah, please, Peter, go ahead. Uh, Peter Jansen, uh, I'm a freelancer. Uh, I sometimes work for Mizima, which is a Myanmar publication, and I was enticed to this program by the blurb, which mentioned that there were Myanmar's tiger population was probably one of the hopes in the region, huh? and yet none of you have talked about Myanmar at all. So I'm going to ask like uh, three questions to the three of the panelists about Myanmar. Right? Mark, uh, uh, in this ASEAN when, I mean, Myanmar is a participant. And you don't hear too much about seizures in Myanmar or Myanmar helping out with these uh, inter-regional cooperation. Can you maybe, you know, I don't, I'm sure you don't want to criticize your neighbor or anything, but I mean, can you just be sort of talk about uh, uh, Myanmar's participation in when and, and uh, how active they've been, what are the problems, not enough training and whatnot. 
Uh, sorry, Tom, uh, uh, on, on Myanmar's target population, does anyone have an estimate, a good estimate? I know everyone was kind of optimistic at first that Myanmar's forests had tigers and uh, it might be uh, uh, hidden treasure, but I mean, everyone seemed to be rather pessimistic or disappointed by the research that was done after, or, or, or now that Myanmar is a little bit more open to this kind of participation. And uh, uh, Kunanak, uh, on Kenkachan, you, you, you are neighboring Myanmar, and supposedly these tiger populations uh, don't care about borders. Uh, uh, what about uh, uh, the two parks? Are they cooperating in terms of trying to protect these tiger populations? And uh, um, what's the progress here? Thanks. We start with Mark. Yeah. Thank you for the questions. Um, actually, for the Myanmar, for the ASEAN, when we have the Secretariat here in Bangkok, Thailand, and in each country of the ASEAN member state, um, there we have the own uh, national uh, tech force. Like for in Myanmar, of course, they have their own national tech force as well, which is, is including the environmental police, uh, military, uh, department of natural park, uh, of course, the CITES, CITES Management Authority and the customs. Well, I can see at this point now, Myanmar is uh, more cooperation, uh, better and better now. And since uh, the Myanmar now is uh, open, the country, so we receive uh, more co coordination from them. And for the operation COBA 3, this is the first time that the uh, Myanmar, Myanmar participate in our uh, operation as well. So I, I see it's a, it's a good sign. Thank you. And in terms of tigers left in Myanmar, as you probably know, Myanmar has the world's largest tiger reserve, Waikeng Valley up in the north of Myanmar. But because of the continued political insta instability, to achieve the levels of law enforcement that are needed is just not possible in Myanmar. And Waikeng Valley, almost, I think we can say it has less than 10 tigers, and it may be you could put the one off the front of that number, possibly, that there are very, very few tigers left in what was when it was established, one of the world's, meant to be one of the world's flagship tiger reserves. The, there is still extensive forest along the um, Thailand-Myanmar border, and there are still tigers in there. However, I think it would be naive to think that there are large numbers and that they can recolonize from the Thailand side. I think Dr. Anak will talk a little bit perhaps about Kankrashan, but I know that some recent camera trapping that has been done on the other side of the Myanmar border has shown there are still tigers there, but they are in very, very, very low numbers. And there are some tigers further north uh, bored in the northern bits of the Western Forest Complex, but there's low numbers, and without effective law enforcement, they will disappear. So, unfortunately, there, I think there is potential. There's still huge amounts of forest, yeah. and that is the thing. It's, it's this forest that is still connecting the Western Forest Complex with the Kangtrashan Forest Complex. So it's that Myanmar is absolutely critical for a long-term, 50-year vision of tiger recovery in the region, but I think it's naive and optimistic to assume there's huge numbers there now, but if Thailand is successful, then maybe it can be um, repopulated in the future. So in, uh, in the area next to Thailand uh, from Gangajan National Park, uh, Myanmar has tried to establish a national park called Tanin Uh Tanin Tayi is the name of the mountain range, Tenesrim, you know, in Myanmar they call Tanin Tayi. In Thailand, we call Tanasi, you know, in English is Tenesrim. And, uh, uh, but I in that area is the KNU territory. So it's very hard to work uh, uh, to try to get something going on the ground. Even it's very difficult for the government uh, people from Myanmar to work into that area. That's what I, uh, we have been informed because late last year, the Thai government, uh, Department of National Parks and Wildlife, tried to initiate the, the uh, coordination uh, with uh, uh, the department of uh, forest department of Myanmar inviting the director general and the team from Myanmar 
to come to Thailand and we uh, took them down to uh, Gangajan to, to show the site on Thailand, the management of the National Park of Thailand. And uh, the, 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 uh, the Director General, Dr. Ji Ji Cho from Myanmar, he is very, very good guy, you know. Uh, where I, I, I think uh, he is uh, uh, the, the one that we can lay our hope on the future. And the team, 10 people coming with him, I found that uh, they are quite impressive in, ter in, in terms of uh, exchange comments and idea for the future. So I think uh, there's some hope uh, for the future, but you know, a lot of people say that we have to wait until the next election in November and see what happens. So that's, that's, that's the progress at the moment. Brian, you want to add something? Yeah. Yeah. Can I, I just want to say something about Myanmar, because uh, Myanmar, uh, during the chairmanship of ASEAN last year, they were the ones who really pushed for the highest ever declaration uh, from heads of states and governments of ASEAN, including uh, China, Japan, US, Russia. They signed a, an East Asia Summit declaration on combating wildlife trafficking. And that is the highest level, the highest ever that it has reached. So uh, it was actually the good work of the government of Myanmar, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, the, the, the Ministry of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Myanmar who really pushed for this together with uh, some champion ASEAN member states and the US government. And now the plan is for the Myanmar government and the ASEAN member states to, to push for it, for, to, to push for the implementation of the operational clauses of that declaration. And uh, we, as we are also working with the government of Myanmar, Freeland and uh, ASEAN UN. They are also looking into uh, enhancing their national legislation. Uh, some of you may know that they have the lowest uh, penalty, penalty in, uh, if you commit a wildlife crime in, uh, in, in ASEAN. I mean, um, uh, not the penal provision, but the but the monetary uh, the monetary uh, <coughs> penalty. It's like fifty dollars maximum if you commit a wildlife crime, but the maximum imprisonment is seven seven years. So we have that study also. Thanks. Um, um, I think you'll have to go up to the mic and queue up. <laughs> go ahead, please. Oh, um, sorry. Um, You've mentioned, we've just come, come across the word encourage. Could you oh. just identify yourself? Oh, sorry, Michael Mackey, freelance. Thanks for the reminder, Nimmel. Um, I, you've just mentioned encouragement, and for the first time someone's mentioned money. We've talked a lot about enforcement. What about the other side of the equation, as I see it, which is incentivizing people? Um, the, we had a presentation on elephants in Laos earlier in the year, and it seemed that their problems were that no one knew how to create economic incentives to preserve working elephants and, and wild elephants in Laos. And I'm wondering if you've ever looked at the economic incentives to preserving wild tiger populations, like, for example, tourism. It seems to work well in other parts of the world. And because we're all, well, there's some journalists in this room, I've got to raise the controversial issue of what happened to the lion in Zimbabwe. Is it possible in a region where there is a record of bad enforcement and corruption that the people who still think hunting is enlightened, like members of the British royal family and our beloved prime minister, that we could actually co create an incentive to keep wild tigers alive for a limited number of years and keep the populations alive by allowing hunting, providing the people who do it pay and really pay, thanks. So just one comment about the economic valuation. I know India, the National Tiger Conservation Authority of India, relatively recently um, did a study of the economic value of a selection of Indian tiger reserves, from the Sundarbans of the mangroves to Kana to some in the Terai Arc. And it came up with very, very high numbers, including ecotourism, water retention, everything like that. I think the issue is to get governments to change their behavior based on this information. 
We can provide information that says a, a well-managed national park is providing 500 million to your economy over 50 years. But is that going to change the behavior of, of a politician now? I think that's a big challenge, and it's one I don't have an answer to, but it's one as a conservation community we need to get answers to. Dr. Anak, you'd like to say something about that, perhaps? The attitude, <laughs> valuing of ecosystems. I, I, I think uh, people in, in Thailand, uh, uh, they try to uh, encourage the idea of uh, 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 ecosystem uh, service, uh, ecosystem services and, 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 and uh, try to get people to think about uh, the economic value of ecosystem for quite some time. Uh, but uh, in Thailand, I think we, we we, we haven't thought so far in the future of allowing incentive from hunting for conservation, for example. So uh, e even at, at, at the beginning of the wildlife law in Thailand, the, the people who drafted the law thought about that and put some thought in the law, but uh, it, it never happened because, uh, you know, uh, when people try to say about uh, hunting for conservation, so uh, you would have a lot of people in the society coming up and against the idea. So that's, that's, that's quite difficult. By the way, before I forget on your way out, you can pick up this uh, brochure from uh, the front desk out there. It's uh, Thailand's National uh, Tiger Recovery Plan. Okay, uh, and I also forgot to um, tell you about the ground rules. Keep your Questions short and precise, and also please identify yourself for the record when you ask them. Go ahead. Nigel Gould Davis from Mahidan University. Thanks to all the uh, panelists for a very interesting discussion. It strikes me that two quite distinct issues were raised. The first was the question of poaching, so organized criminality targeting specific species. And the solutions to this may not be simple to implement, but they're very clear. It's a matter of anti poaching law enforcement, interdiction, and so on. But also educating the end consumers, uh, those who wear these things, also those who take these things as medicine or pseudo-medicine. I'd like us to perhaps say more about the, the fact that these things are wholly ineffic ineffic inefficacious. Uh, why don't we do that? Uh, there's no medicinal benefit from tiger parts, for example. But the second issue, which is what Tom said something very interesting about, is the quite different question of the implications of the damming of the Mekong. So there's a Mekong not just as a region, but as a particular river with significant downstream consequences of uh, the dams. Now that's more difficult than poaching for a number of reasons. Uh, one is there's a state policy. This is an organized criminality. Second, uh, that it risks creating tensions between the countries of the region. Already a toxic narrative is just beginning to take hold where Laotian export of electricity to Thailand to keep Bangkok malls going has severe impacts for Vietnamese and Cambodian communities. So there's a real risk to watch there. Uh, and finally, you can't just not do this because these communities, this region needs energy. So you need some practical and constructive alternative. You just can't say, we're going to stop uh, meeting the, end, the future power supply needs of this region. So if you could say more about specifically the consequences of Mekong River management. I think that would be very interesting. Thank you. Who would like to take that? Mekong. I think make one very quick. I think one of the points that I tried to make, that a, a lot of these mainstream dams were designed in the 1950s, before the civil unrest that subsequently followed. And they're still using a blueprint from the 1950s, and technology that is largely, again, from the 1950s. So, for example, this Don Sahong Dam, which is planned in one of the channels uh, south of the Khon Falls on the Cambodia-Lao border, there is an alternative that would have produced more e electricity than the current Don Sahong plan. It would have used less concrete, which may be then linked to who is providing the concrete to build the dams, but it would have provided an more energy at a much lower environmental cost. But those choices aren't being made by, by governments. So I think developing a coherent and possibly transboundary, as you said, energy policy for the greater Mekong regionally is something that needs to be done and needs to be done using um, uh, modern technology.
Who would like to respond to the question on education of consumers changing the mindset, changing consumer behavior, reducing demand reduction basically, right? Yeah, uh, actually we have a whole program in Freeland uh, because we are implementing a USAID program. It's called ARREST, which was uh, mentioned in the video a while ago. ARREST stands for Asia's Regional Response to Endangered Species Trafficking, and we have a component on demand reduction. So it's a, it's a whole suite of uh, demand reduction strategies, and we are targeting, and we have developed uh, a, a mechanism on, you know, who to target, who are the consumers. Uh, in uh, three countries in ASEAN, one, one is from uh, the, 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 the ASEAN region, uh, it's uh, two, uh, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, and China. Vietnam and China being uh, largely considered as a, as a consuming country. So we are focusing on educating the, the youth, the government officials, and in Vietnam there is uh, also a, uh, a study that we are looking at uh, that uh, the con most of those who are consuming are women, right Solma? Women and uh, <laughs> middle-aged women. So there's a target group that, uh, <coughs> but, but there's a whole campaign for that. <coughs> Also just some of the some of, for example, I think the rhino horn consumption in Vietnam, it is not being used medicinally. It's being used as a high-end status symbol, almost as like a recreational drug, perhaps in the West. People generally know that it doesn't have, or probably understand, it has no medicinal effect. But if it's costing them a ridiculous amount of money, and it's about consump conspicuous consumption and demonstrating your wealth then it doesn't actually matter that it doesn't have a medicinal, a medicinal use. And that's some of the additional messaging that needs to be got, a, got across to the consumers, not talking about medicinal, just talking about status and better ways to perhaps display your flashy wealth. It's actually the same for ivory. Yeah. Or for tiger bone, for that matter. I mean, there's, there's no medicinal value at all. Uh, I'm sorry, the ivory is uh, mostly consider, it's considered for, uh, for lu it's luxury, it's a luxury, luxury item, item yeah. so if you have a luxury then you are, uh, you're considered famous in your uh, high so group, so that's, mm. that's right. Dr. Thailand and China. Uh, just uh, to add my opinion, uh, uh, for some species, you know, like tigers, uh, even rhinos, I, I, in my opinion, I am not sure if you have money, and you have to prioritize the money you have. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, if we put too much money on demand reduction, I, I don't know if it's going to save the species in, the, in time. You know, species would be gone before you change the demand. You know? yeah, so, so if you have money right now, I, I think a lot of international organizations try to put into protection first, you know, strengthen enforcement first, so for tigers. So that's, that's uh, because in China, for example, a lot of organizations trying to change, you know, Chinese. But chi 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 China is very, very large, you know, more <laughs> many people. You can change some, but uh, it won't have uh, uh, effect, you know, uh, enough to save tigers. Well, so just like the Dr. Nick say for the uh, demand reduction, uh, for me, basically, I'm focusing on the law enforcement. So basically, in the ASEAN, when we have the uh, the program we call the uh, Y scan, which is implemented by the arrest program, and is monitored by the uh, ASEAN Wildlife Enforcement Network. So basically, um, in order to fight against the wildlife crime, it's supposed to be the uh, public and private partnership support to help each other. So if you guys have the uh, smartphone, uh, you can go to your Play Store and searching for the word Y scan. Basically, it's free. You can download it. Uh, basically, I think you need the Wi-Fi connection because it's quite large program. It's about 200 something meg megabytes. Uh, it's totally free. And basically, in this program, uh, the civilians um, can report you know, the uh, wildlife uh, seizure. Or if sometimes you're not sure if, if, if the wildlife or the, uh, the timber is on the protected species or not, we also have the library uh, for you. 
and then in in this program also have the uh, the contact information uh, to all of the ten country in ASEAN. So you can connect. You can choose to you can uh, choose to uh, send the information um, to the law enforcement officer, or you can send it to the secretariat here in Bangkok. Thank you. Do we know how many people have actually downloaded this app? Oh, it's a lot now. It's couple thousand, couple thousand now. But right now, it's only working on the uh, Android system, not 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 the iPhone yet. So hopefully, if you guys can spread uh, uh, this program out and more people use it, and more people download, and more people submitting the case or sharing the intelligence, so we can have more fun. So in the nearly future, we can create for the iPhone as well. Thank you. Okay, next question, please. Hi, my name is Stuart, and I work for Altian Burma, uh, reporting on a host of topics related to that country. And I'm interested, again, in um, development along the Mekong. Uh, my question is pretty related to uh, the former gentleman's question about intergovernmental um, bilateral agreements to change or propose uh, alternatives for development. I'm wondering, Tom, if you see room for the U.S. expressing grief over how we've um, constructed 75,000 dams in our country. I think there's a paradigm shift nowadays coming from Oregon myself. So I think you know in the Pacific Northwest there's a host of dams slated for decommissioning, um, California as well. So. I think that could, if we could provide a case example of how much we lament what we've done, that could maybe um, change the governmental course of action because they don't listen to villagers protesting, mobilizing through great effort on the ground. And then also question, uh, also interested in uh, the potential for comprehensive ecological studies, uh, perhaps, I guess, um, implemented through the help of villagers uh, along the Mekong, re or along the, the river, the uh, entire watershed area to gather more access, or gather, excuse me, gather more data on the consequences downstream of these dams. Thanks. Yeah, I think first, I'm not a particular expert on the dams and the freshwater issues, uh, but I, I strongly suspect that the government of Laos wouldn't be particularly receptive to messages from, from the US. We know that um, <laughs> Hillary Clinton, they had a meeting of all the environmental mi ministers that um, Hillary Clinton, who we saw on the video earlier, was at, and the environmental minister of Laos stood up on that meeting and said, we won't be constructing any of these dams unless we get the full approval of all the other countries. And I think Hillary Clinton left quite happy and we had our CEO of WWF US was there at the time, and he left delighted at the influence that the US is now having in this region. But of course, Lao then completely ignored or completely changed their mind, and the dam is being constructed. You're three days later, Gordon confirms that, that, they, that they started it. So I would be skeptical of that. And also possibly on how community fishery data is going to change their mind. The body of science is there. It's just being ignored. Yeah, <clears throat> my name is Somnet Interpanya from Radio Free Asia. So I would like to ask, uh, would, you, would you please to emphasize a little bit more about the situation of the wildlife in Laos? First question. The second question, most of people are concerned about the dam construction of the dam in the mainstream of the Mekong. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, what is the best way for Laos to develop their country? Because they have only few resources. The only few resources uh, is a natural resource, mining and uh, energy from hydro energy. So what would you suggest Lao government and then what the other country can help Laos to develop the way that is uh, not we want, I mean, you mean. And in terms of investment, Laos, 
I mean, it's a very poor country. Very, like, uh, in terms of the GDP, it's less than 10 billion, right? And then there are no other solution for Laos. So what would you suggest Lao government? Any special expert that can uh, help Laos Good question. to do something better than what it is doing now? Thank you. Yeah. Good questions. Who's, who's going to take those? Tom? Yeah, I, I, I think in terms of the energy, as, as po possibly I, I, I mentioned before, I think there are options for sustainable hydropower development. So, so I, think, I think there are possibilities, and again, I, I, I can't talk so eloquently about the mining, but again, I think there has probably been some sustainable mining in Laos and some of the, the funds invested back to the government for protected area management and for livelihoods and things. Um, yeah, it's a difficult question and one that, yeah, one that I, I don't really have any answers for. But I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything else. Does anyone else want to? Well, yeah. I just want to add that uh, the Lao government is under a trade uh, sanction recommendation by the CITI Secretariat. Uh, all trade, all kind of trade. I think they, they were given uh, a couple of months to provide some documentation or else they cannot try to trade with with any country. This is because they have, uh, uh, they missed in, uh, they missed submitting the, uh, the Tiger Action Plan to CITES Secretariat. And last March they were given this notification by the CITES Secretariat, uh, the CITES uh, Standing Committee. And what does this mean? Means uh, Lao cannot uh, trade. They, they've been trading what uh, orchids and uh, and other uh, legal wildlife stuff. And uh, with this sanction, they cannot do it because they cannot uh, provide uh, clear uh, uh, plans to protect their tigers. So that goes hand in hand. Good protection means you can have uh, good trade, and that's what we've been advocating also in our uh, work. Well, it was a difficult question to answer. Yes. Um, go ahead, please. Next one. Uh, I'm Andrew Silver. Uh, I'm a retired epidemiologist, and I do volunteer work with the Karen Department of Health and Welfare. That's affiliated with the KNU, the Karen National Union, which is relevant to my question for Dr. Anak. You uh, briefly mentioned the Karen National Union as controlling uh, territory on the Burma side of this national park. I can't remember the name. I believe it's in Pachuap Kiri Khan. Uh, you can correct me on that. Uh, but uh, so the question simply is, uh, can you talk also with the Karen National Union about uh, uh, helping to preserve the tiger population, and uh, okay, well that's my question. I think they have tried. Actually, they uh, uh, I I talked to uh, the government people in Myanmar, and they said uh, you know uh, they mentioned about peace agreement with KNU, and they I I think uh, they have discussed with uh, some high level people in KNU about 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 that national park. So I think there's some progress, but I, I'm not sure. I don't have any uh, deeper knowledge on this. Well, this is something that I can add a little bit more about, because uh, the Karen National Union has its own forestry department. It has its own protected area network. It has its own forestry legislation, which is generally speaking pretty good. I think I understand in some of the traditional Karen areas, the penalty for poaching tiger and elephant is death. So, so there are some quite um, robust law enforcement, and in some of these areas they've been working with um, other organizations to support law enforcement. So I, I, I think the issue, particularly <coughs> for, for bigger NGOs like WWF and WCS as well, with MOUs of the central government, it then makes it a little bit more difficult to then also try to have MOUs of the Karen government. And I know it is also a big impediment for the Karens to get funding. 
to a lot of the big international funding that is given for tiger conservation, for example, needs to be signed off by central government. So for me and Murray, we need to have a stamp from Napierdor, which is very difficult for the um, KNU to get. So I, I think, I think there's, there is hope for a, for a strong uh, KNU conservation movement. And as Dr. Anak says, as the peace process um, continues to m move forward, uh, better relations between the, the guys at the ministry, at the MOCAF in Napierdor, and the Karen Forestry um, Department. May I hey. comment? Sorry? M may I comment on the answers? OK, one well, quick follow-up. Brief, briefly, uh, just drawing from analogy with my experience with the Karen Department of Health and Welfare, which uh, provides most of the health care in large areas of eastern Burma along the border, where the uh, Burmese or Myanmar Ministry of Health is totally ineffective. Uh, it's no use to go through Naypyidaw to try to aff affect or improve the health care in the ethnic minority areas. Uh, the cross-border aid that comes without going through uh, the Myanmar government is, um, has been effective for or more or less for uh, 20 years or more. And uh, I imagine that also for the forestry and uh, animal preservation it would be more effective to deal directly with KNU rather than go through uh, the Myanmar government. Yeah, well that's, yeah, I guess that's a dilemma of Myanmar because you have so many uh, semi-autonomous or de facto autonomous ethnic groups running their own areas. Next question, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, Sean Wilmore, the president of the International Ranger Federation and um, managing director of its charity, um, the Think Green Line Foundation. I'm here for World Ranger Day celebrations in Thailand, which has been great to recognise the rangers. Though we've just released the honour roll of rangers killed around the world and it's 52 rangers this past year, 60% um, by poachers. Um, uh, the year before that it was 73, the year before that 106. Um, I think over the last 13 years it's close to 1,300 rangers killed around the world. The hotspot is actually Asia now, not Africa. Um, my question though is about demand reduction. Uh, I would agree with the comment made by the doctor about it takes a generation to actually change the behaviour. Um, and while we wait for that change, we're losing species and rangers don't have the equipment, the support, the training. Would it be more effective in the demand reduction side, which we don't act in, but we certainly encourage any aspect that will reduce poaching, would it be more effective to talk about the human cost of wildlife trafficking rather than animals? Because people purchasing wildlife products may not care for the animals, but they may react to the human deaths related to wildlife trafficking. Who wants to tackle that? It's a question of messaging, right? To, for demand reduction. No takers? Brian. Well, I, I okay. think all the demand reduction messaging should be evidence-based. So if there's evidence that consumers may change their behavior, if it's, pa if it's pa uh, pictured as it's killing rangers, killing people, as well as killing animals, and I think it'd be a, great, a fantastic idea, yeah. May I also add that, uh, that the wildlife protection in ASEAN is not really a security issue right now. Why? Because uh, wildlife crime, wild, uh, timber trafficking, uh, IUU, it's not part of the uh, priority areas of the SOMTC of ASEAN. SOMTC is the senior officials meeting on transnational crime and they decide on what are the serious crimes in ASEAN. Uh, money laundering, human trafficking, etc, uh, etc. Et so it's uh, eight priority crimes. And since 2008, since 2008, uh, Freeland together with uh, the US government and ASEAN and many of the champion ASEAN member states have been working to uh, work with the highest level uh, ASEAN uh, senior officials and ministers to, to create a ninth priority area. And uh, only this year we, orga we organized with the UNODC uh, SOMTC uh, senior officials meeting here in Bangkok. And in that meeting they decided to endorse a ninth priority area to the ministers this coming September in Kuala Lumpur uh, and if they and if the ministers approve, 
then wildlife crime, timber trafficking, IUU will become uh, the ninth priority area in the uh, and uh, serious crime arena in ASEAN. And what does this mean? If if this becomes a serious crime, then uh, agencies implementing or working on law enforcement uh, to support uh, you know to to combat wildlife crime will get more resources. Right now, a lot of the law enforcement uh, agencies they complain. Oh, we don't have money, it's not a priority, no one believes in us, in the government. If it goes into that level, then at least you can anchor your discourse uh, with the government that, hey, this is a priority area. And if the ministers approve this, this ninth priority area this coming September, this will be the first also in the world that uh, a regional body has upgraded environmental crimes or wildlife crime as a, as a serious crime. Uh, the UN, Freeland, and uh, ASEAN UN have been uh, uh, pushing this hard in this, uh, in this level. So hopefully it trickles down and uh, it goes into the, and support will go to the law enforcers on the ground, to the rangers, to the police uh, who are, uh, you know, uh, working a lot with Mark. <laughs> Thanks. Um, any, uh, you had a question? Earlier, go ahead. Oh, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. No, uh, I'm Anwin from uh, Vietnamese Service Radio Free Asia. And um, we, we know that you see every country, every government now they have uh, a lot of measures to uh, protect, to conserve uh, the wildlife, uh, like in Vietnam. And I'm very interested in listening and noting that we have the wise scam you have just mentioned, Mark had just mentioned. So why the government and every organization, they want to involve the community, more and more people in the fight against uh, the use of uh, wildlife uh, stuff. So why, why haven't you uh, popularized uh, such, a, such an app? And um, because today, uh, this is the first time I hear about that. And, uh, I, I have the recommendation that it should be uh, made for the, the application for more people. And like in Vietnam now, you have one-fourth of the population now, they are IT user. Mm. Thank you for the uh, comments. Uh, basically, of course, we, we, uh, we, we try our best to announce the Y-Scan uh, programs and then uh, we also um, introduced them to the all of the ten uh, ASEAN member states, you know, gov government relating the government uh, office um, to use them. And for the wide scan, basically, um, in the nearly future, uh, the ASEAN when we already discussed with the loyal Thai police, and uh, we hope that in the nearly future, if the loyal Thai police uh, can uh, might help us to manage uh, the programs. So I think uh, more of the uh, government officials, they, they will feel uh, more comfortable um, to sharing uh, the information and intelligence, you know, into the WildScan. Thank you. Oh, uh, just to add, uh, WildScan was launched uh, last month in Vietnam, uh, in Vietnamese with the government, uh, with Monre and uh, with MARD. Monre being the Environment Ministry and MARD being the Agriculture and Rural Development, which monitors CITES. And uh, the English version was launched early this year here in Bangkok uh, with the Vietnamese uh, Director of CITES, who was then uh, Chairman of ASEAN Wildlife Enforcement Network. Another question? We have time for like a couple more. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Jamal. Um, not a question so much as a series of observations. You want to say? Uh, Tim knows who I am, uh, so ask him. Now, uh, my name is Dave Lawson. I work currently for Tigers Alive in the WWF network. But I've also had the pleasure and uh, honor of working for most of the people on the panel, including ASEAN Win and uh, WCS and allied to the Mekong program. Um, as a point of information, very, very soon, it may be tomorrow actually, the United Nations General Assembly will make an announcement and, 
and pass a resolution on wildlife crime. And this is the first time that it has reached that level. Now, the cynics amongst us, and because this is a journalist meeting, I'm sure that's most people in the room, will say, what does that mean? Well, nothing if nothing happens after that. And I think the problem we've got is we've now got very high level attention on wildlife crime from anti-poaching in the field to wildlife trafficking. And you've seen many examples today by this panel of what happens. But some of these species are running out of time. And what we need to concentrate on is how do we get these high level, very well intentioned speeches to action on the ground. And that's something that I wrestle with every day because that's my job. I would also suggest that, and I don't want to denigrate COBRA 1, 2, and 3. I think they've been great initiatives. But I would just point out that we don't need a COBRA 4. We need a continuous COBRA. Because unless we do that, some of the species that we now regard as icons are going to slip through our fingers. I'm wearing this T-shirt because it's Global Tiger Day. <coughs> We are very, very close to losing tigers, period. Can you imagine turning around to your grandchildren and saying, I'm sorry, we lost tigers. Tough. I can't imagine that. That's what drives me. But that's the point. We need to translate the talk into what happens on the ground. Now, those people on the panel that know me well will know my reaction to anti-poaching. I am slightly to the right of Attila the Hun. That's fine, okay? That's me. But what the point is, we need to try and now say, and the media has a real, real impact here. How can the media help people like me get this message across that translates into on-ground action? On-ground action needs determination. We've got that in spades. It needs money. But more than that, it needs political will. How do we convince our political leaders this is not something they can put on a back shelf? This is something that they need to address now. Thank you. Mark, do you want to say something about the COBRA yes. operations? Yeah. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Um, actually, for the Co COBA member country, uh, we, we agree uh, with you. And actually, we already discussed this back in the November 2014 in the Lyons at the Interpol um, uh, Secretariat. Basically, we would like to create the future COBA, not to be the COBA 4, 5, or 6. But we would like to be creating to be the project COBA. But in, or, but in order to create to be the project COBA, it's requiring the uh, uh, financial support, large financial support, and then the human resources uh, as well. So for the operation uh, COBA 3, we will have uh, the review on this coming of October. And on this review of the Operation Cuba 3, if the uh, member country they agree that um, they will support for the manpower for the Operation Cuba, and then uh, hopefully uh, we get more financial support as well, so we can create it uh, to be the Project Cuba. Let me tell you why at this the COBA 3 I changing the month. The COBA 1 and COBA 2 normally is operating on January for one month period. So now the poacher or the smucker they know that our operation is happening in January. So uh, from our uh, study, that's why we didn't tell them, you know, at this time when we're gonna make it. So that's why we ship it to May. So that's why we have more results at this time because uh, they was thinking oh maybe they didn't do it because they didn't want to do it or whatever reason it is and 
for the uh, ongoing uh, action, uh, for the political will, uh, I think it's really important. You know, for the if if the uh, high ranking officer or the politicians, they understand uh, about the wildlife, about the illegal loggings, so they can support more. You know, in the parliament. Because the parliament, you know, if because let me tell you, uh, the let 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 say the uh, the issue here in Thailand. Because uh, when I was the loyal Thai police, uh, back then, even the uh, national uh, resources uh, division uh, of the loyal Thai police tried to you know ask for the uh, uh, more money for their unit. It's very really difficult for them. Because people are thinking, oh, it's that it's not the priority crimes like Mr. Brian said earlier. Uh, and I myself, I used to propose the wildlife crime to be the transnational crime here in ASEAN, and it's not easy. Because in every year, you know, the high-ranking officer, he was talking like mostly like permanent secretariat or the commissioner general, they change, you know, every one or two years. So of course, when they change the new one coming in, so you have to convince them again. But uh, I think the good things right now we have the uh, IPA, which is uh, the ASEAN uh, inter uh, government uh, body, and I want Mr. Brian to uh, describe more about the IPA because the IPA I think it already accept the uh, the action plan for wildlife. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just to add on to what uh, Mark said, uh, we are working with the ASEAN Interparliamentary Assembly. It is the uh, group of parliaments in ASEAN. It's they're like the Capitol Hill, as they as they describe themselves, the Capitol Hill of ASEAN. And uh, in 2012, they issued uh, again a resolution to upgrade wildlife crime and for them to fix their laws. Because if you want on the ground support, you need, uh, as you said, the Dave uh, political will from, from the leaders or from the commanders. But if there is no political will from the prime minister or the minister or the, or the MPs controlling the budget, the members of parliament, then how can you implement uh, operations or give more support to rangers, etc.? That's why we are working very hard to sensitize the political leaders in the parliaments. And actually, uh, this September, we are planning to bring the, some members of parliaments from ASEAN to go into the field and uh, go into Khaoyai, for example, to meet with the rangers. Uh, uh, our team, one, our training team is planning to organize a tri trilateral uh, ranger training, uh, park ranger training. And we would like to maximize that, uh, that, uh, that event so that uh, we can bring in some policymakers. Because these policymakers eventually, they, they control the budget, they control the priorities of the government. And we want to tell them that you know, these rangers are having problems and uh, you need to fix your laws. We show them our study and uh, they go into the field so it's not them just in their offices, in the, their ivory towers, just uh, listening to presentations of NGOs or, or other government bodies, but uh, we want them to go into the field also. Good idea. Hello, um, I'm Nicholas, I'm a, I'm a student. Um, we've been talking so far about animal trafficking and uh, trade, but um, I just wanted to ask about uh, lumber trafficking and uh, how that compares to uh, animal trafficking, such as tigers and, and such. And, and I know that, that that's a big issue, especially in Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. And uh, I'm wondering how that compares with, um, to animal trafficking with regard to how much revenue it gains, uh, how much it costs for, for rangers to uh, protect, and, and, um, and uh, how, how much it's, is being consumed so far. Timber, timber and wildlife, what is it? Oh, timber and wildlife, uh, 
Actually, we are doing uh, the data collection also, the government and the, the open data source of, the, of uh, wildlife crime together with the uh, ASNWEN actually. And uh, just before I came here, I was just looking at the quarterly report that we submit to uh, member states, I mean, the, to the focal points of ASEAN WEN. And uh, the black market value based uh, on the document that I received, it's the, from the calculation that the analysts uh, have been doing, it's like 30 million, just for three months, 30 million uh, seized uh, contrabands, uh, timber, uh, wildlife, uh, marine species, and ASEAN. It's like, it's only for March, April, May, no, no, April, May, June. April, May, June, and that's already $30 million. And that's the minimum, that's really the minimum uh, black market value. It can go further. That's only for three months. And the bulk of it is timber? Uh, I have not seen the 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 breakdown, uh, the breakdown. Mm -hmm. okay. but there's timber. <clears throat> and just I think the we've talked about the demand for wildlife products, the demand for luxury hardwood furniture in this region, and then also going to China is absolutely phenomenal. I can only really speak from my personal experience in Cambodia, but the house of every aspiring middle class person in Cambodia is full of hardwood furniture. And there are shops everywhere in Phnom Penh selling hardwood furniture that comes from illegally logged from within the protected areas in Cambodia. <coughs> and we've also recently done a study on the Lao-Vietnam border. And the volume of timber that is being officially exported out of Vietnam, out of Laos into Vietnam, is something like 5% of the timber that Vietnam says is being imported into Vietnam. So you... <coughs> So Laos is, Lao is losing millions of dollars every year in unclaimed tax revenue through the illegal smuggling of timber across that border. So that is maybe one answer to another question of how, you, how Lao could better develop by cutting out some of this corruption and this money laundering and this tax evasion. But to me, it's working in the forest. It is almost on the ground in the forest in Cambodia. It's a bigger issue than wildlife at the moment simply because of the value of timber you see ch trees chopped down in the forest, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars of timber lying there in the forest. And it is something that is going to the highest levels of government, unfortunately, certainly in Laos and in Cambodia. And it's a very, again, a very difficult thing to deal with, particularly as the demand shows no sign of decreasing, particularly, again, in Cambodia, and I presume Vietnam, Laos, and on to China. It's a, it's a real worry. In fact, um, I had mentioned earlier that there was a forest trends report which was expected out uh, this evening. It was released a few minutes ago. Um, according to them, Cambodia is losing forests at the rate of 804 square miles a year. That's the size, it's a little bit more than Singapore, uh, 804 square miles a year. And um, it's mainly because the government gives large land concessions to large scale companies, many of which operate illegally. And these allocations of land for economic development total 2.6 million hectares in 2013 alone. So it's pretty phenomenal what's happening in Cambodia. Okay, can any I, last question? No? Can okay. I add a little bit more? Oh, go ahead, okay. please. Just like I think the uh, Dr. Anek presentation earlier that he showed the forest, you know, in Thailand, you know, it's very few now because uh, they're cutting a lot here in Thailand. So that's why I think right now uh, is, you know, the they went to the Laos or the Cambodia. And for the ASEAN when, uh, of course, in each country, we have our uh, national tech force. And this, our national tech force is not only uh, uh, patrol for the wildlife, we also patrol for the uh, illegal logging as well. And then for ASEAN when we really concern about uh, the illegal logging, especially uh, the lost wood. Uh, the on the May 2015, we just have the uh, first uh, special investigation group of lost wood that has been conducted. And then in this group, we uh, keep communicate if we have the information or the intelligence that can exchange. Thank you, Michael. 
It'll, it'll be quick. Dr. Gray, you've just acknowledged the scale of the problem and how deep it goes into the government in Cambodia. How would you reconcile that with your intention that you talked about earlier of rewilding tigers into eastern Cambodia? I think part of our rationale of, of rewilding, re, what, we, what we're calling rewilding the Serengeti of Asia, because it was a landscape that in the 1950s was called the Serengeti of Asia, because of the large numbers of um, wild cattle and ungulates, is that if we can get the highest possible levels of political buy-in behind a reintroduction in Cambodia, if we call one tiger Hun and one tiger Sen, then maybe when they're reintroduced into the forests, that will be the high level of political buy-in that's needed to prevent concessions, like Nirmal just said, being put onto the forest. It's an ambitious plan, but it may be one of the only way, maybe a way to try and secure the wilderness and secure all the forests that are in there by getting that high level political buy-in. Right, last question. Yes. Please. Um, Mahidon University, in your Punish Pan. Um, about the rewilding the tigers. We have a lot of tigers in, in captivity. And the reason why we don't breed them, or one reason why we don't breed them or release them, because we have this thing about species. Well, in, in appearance, there are so many species. But if you do the DNA, you will find that there are fewer species than expected. And with that, you, you means you can cross a, a tiger from say, Bangladesh with a tiger from in captivity from, uh, from Vietnam and released in Viet into Vietnam uh, habitat or into Bangladesh habitat. And uh, so we have to define species by both DNA and appearance. You will find that uh, in the Chattuck market, so many fighting fish look very different in terms of fins, colors, and, and, and the pattern. And they are all the same, the one species only. So don't judge only by appearance. You do the DNA, and then you find that because of the crisis 80,000 years ago, because eruption in Sumatra, and the tiger population became very small, and they have only, they've had only 80,000 years to evolve, so they're not that different. You know, that's exactly true, and you gave a very nice summary there of a recent paper that was published in the past month saying exactly that, and maybe Dr. Anak can add something afterwards, that essentially all mainland tigers are now being regarded as a single subspecies. And, and the isolation we're seeing now is isolation that has come in the past 100 years when their range has, has massively declined, as again, as Dr. Anik um, illustrated. So the mainland tigers are largely the same, and as you said, they're very adaptable animals and potentially sourcing tigers from, from India or South Asia for a reintroduction in Cambodia would, I think, be ecologically, socially, and, I think, politically acceptable. So, Anak, do you want to add anything else about Last tiger word. subspecies? <laughs> I, 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 know I have seen the, a, a paper uh, uh, published after they have done the thorough uh, genetic analysis of tigers, and they still, you know, divided you know, tiger into different subspecies based on genetic analysis that that paper published already. So uh, I think the issue of subspecies is the issue that, you know, can be uh, controversial for quite a long time. If you uh, want to reintroduce tiger in Cambodia, people would try to say that you have to reintroduce Indo-Chinese tigers, not Bengal tigers. So, so, so that, that this issue is quite, you know, uh, sensitive in among scientists and, and, and conservationists. So it's going to be a lot of arguments before you uh, try to convince them to re reintroduce tigers from a, a, a cross, crossing subspecies into different places. Okay, well, I think uh, we're running late, so I, they're available here if you want to, so go one on one. Thank you very much to all our panelists. It's been great having you here. Really excellent panel. Thank you very much and thank you all for coming. <laughs>